Um, well, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we'll take you through uh, next uh, next is investor presentation and open it up for questions uh, uh, in the last five minutes or so. So, what is next innovation? We create di disruptive, sustainable innovations using advanced materials and manufacturing technologies to support a, a, a circular economy. What we're focused on right now is uh, um, a fully compostable K-cup, as well as a, a fully compostable uh, Nespresso pod, which we anticipate to launch in uh, Q3 here. So uh, those are our focuses, but our, our technology can be used towards multiple uh, items. You know, we've been approached to do coffee creamers, um, uh, we've been approached to do eyeglass frames. Uh, it really is endless. We've been approached to do uh, packaging for uh, meat and fish trays, re replacing those uh, styrofoam uh, uh, meat and fish trays you see at the grocery store. So consumer demand is driving innovation for sustainable alternatives. Advancements in sustainable materials technology has created a generational opportunity for product innovators. And next is at the forefront of the convergence of advanced material science with manufacturing technologies to develop sustainable consumer products. Global plastic crisis, uh, you know, this is stuff uh, everybody always hears about. Uh, you know, 365 million tons of plastic is produced year over year. Less than 9% of this is recycled. Uh, reason why recycling doesn't work, in, uh, in my opinion, uh, one, it requires a lot of human effort. It requires most of the times for you to uh, rip things apart and take things apart. I, I don't see a lot of people doing that. You know, the whole purpose of single serve coffee pods was convenience, but obviously uh, it's also a big waste issue. So, you know, 79% of plastics in general end up in our environments, lands and oceans. Uh, the plastic pods are a major contributor uh, to, uh, to some of this waste issues as these things could take anywhere from 500 to uh, 10,000 plus years to break down. Understanding the uh, bigger problem, which is a circular economy. Uh, plastic waste in local landfills is over overflowing. Uh, there's a, a massive global R&D initiative for alternative materials to replace. Uh, conventional plastic is gaining momentum. There's an increased need for new industrial facilities to provide quick digestion solutions for waste. Uh, new materials innovation looks promising, but industrial compost facility struggles with materials, uh, material acceptance. Compost certification uh, agencies like BPI, which is the main certification agency here in, uh, in North America, they're at odds with the industrial compost facilities as to what is compostable, meaning there's a lot of products out there that are BPI certified uh, compostable, but they actually do not break down in any of these facility, uh, in, in any of these uh, industrial compost facilities. So, you know, we saw that as an opportunity. So we did things different. We actually um, uh, did an independent compost study as well as ecotoxicity studies, and the res results were amazing. So we did those independent of uh, going out and getting any type of a, a certification. So our pod can break down in as little as 35 days. We'll go through that a little bit later. And or what it, the ecotoxicity study, what that shows is that our, the soil that's used after our pods are composted in it, there's no negative effects on the growth of carrots or vegetables. Why are we targeting a global coffee market? Well, it's massive. I mean, global coffee market was uh, valued at 102 billion in 2019 and is expected to grow to 155 billion by 2026. At-home coffee services are uh, getting attention, especially through this pandemic. You know, people's habits are changing. People are not hanging out at coffee shops anymore. You're actually starting to see uh, Starbucks and a lot of big brands uh, shut down coffee shops. As, as more of the focus is uh, online and just getting coffee, uh, coffee products into uh, people's homes now. The global coffee pod and capsule mar uh, market is expected to reach 29 billion by 2025. Uh, just numbers uh, for, uh, for you to understand. K-cup, uh, these K-cups in North America, there's about 18 billion of these uh, consumed every year, produced and consumed every year. Nespresso, which is more Europe and Asia, and actually is, is uh, getting more attention in North America now. And these are about 23 to 25 billion a year. So it, both of them are massive markets. They have massive dis uh, distribution, and they're both ready for disruption. Single-serve coffee pods. Uh, 
50% of all coffee is consumed in a pod. Single serve coffee pods continue to still grow at about eight and a half percent compounded annually. So why hasn't there been a smart coffee pod that has emerged as a category killer? killer? Challenging engineering, compromised taste, toxicity. You know, this pod, uh, this was not an easy pod to make. It, it has taken us five years of really understanding the materials and how they work uh, together and as, as well as how they work at high speed. So the solution is our is our uh, patented next pod. We do have a patent on the pod. Uh, it is plant-based, fully compostable, no compromise. It is science-backed. As I mentioned, we've done independent ecotoxicity and compostability studies on this uh, that show, you know, the science and industrial studies do. Uh, our, our pod does work uh, at a science and an industrial scale level as well. As I mentioned, five years of R&D, uh, we've mastered barrier without compromise and proved compostability in as little as 35 days. And what we've learned with these materials over the last five years, we're able to transfer this to other product initiatives a lot quicker than five years. As I mentioned, these are some of the results of our uh, scientific and commercial validation. Uh, no evidence of toxicity after six weeks of uh, next pod compost that was used. Uh, in optimum conditions, our pod has broken down in as little as 35 days at an industrial compost. But on average, you know, we did, I think, 14 to 15 different processes for at, at this compost facility. At average, it'll break down in 70 days, which is still uh, pretty amazing. And now, after we know our pod will break down in a compost facility, now we will go get our BPI certification. Just some interesting facts about our pod, as I mentioned, compostable in as little as 35 days. There is barrier. Uh, we don't use any adhesives, so there's no glues or anything. We have our own, uh, we have our own uh, proprietary uh, ways of welding this. Uh, there, we use soy-based ink. Uh, it's cool to the touch, but one of the most interesting things about this is it's great to have a compostable product, but it's even better that you actually have a cup of coffee that tastes great. And the reason why that is we've nailed extraction and we're actually able to get more volume in our capsule versus a regular plastic K-cup. So this is really our approach to solving uh, any issues uh, with our technology, even beyond coffee. We designed the compostable product using CAD modeling. Uh, we designed the plant-based materials. We apply our knowledge in polymer science to uh, determine uh, and design the plant-based resins. We rapid prototype with 3D printing. Uh, we're able to manufacture we're, we're in this process of becoming vertically integrated, which we'll get into. And we're actually able to manufacture these bioplastics in-house now using high-speed injection molding. Uh, we were able to assemble finished products using our uh, IP in bioplastics manufacturing to scale new innovations and validate with customers and validate uh, products end of life. So this is actually a new initiative that we just took on. Uh, it's a very important initiative is Right now, uh, some of the stuff when we're uh, looking at our plant-based resins and our plant-based parts, we're actually working with third-party suppliers for this and uh, service providers. We're actually starting to bring this stuff all in-house. When we announce our uh, Nespresso launch, uh, we'll be able to make the resins, uh, this all in-house as opposed to getting the resin from Nebraska, sending it to Asia to get the mold and then sending it back. Uh, there's a couple issues there. Obviously, uh, you could be waiting a couple months at a time to actually get the stuff from overseas, or sorry, get get the different parts from overseas, as well as there's IP issues. If, if we're going to be a, 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 a IP rich company, we need to do more things in house. And you know, in, in 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 reality, with our partners, we understand these materials a lot better than most people uh, around the planet. Leveraging IP to create new innovations. As I mentioned, you know, we are uh, an IP heavy company. Uh, we have a two pronged approach to IP. Uh, you know, we have IP around our proprietary automation. All our uh, lines are highly customized as well as we have uh, IP around our materials and how our pods are built. Uh, we're actually, as I mentioned, we're able to get more coffee uh, in our pod uh, versus uh, some of our competitors. Uh, the whole uh, working with the firm out of Vermont, we're at, what we're doing is we're strengthening our competitive advantage and barrier to entry. Uh, as I mentioned, a, a lot of our equipment is uh, highly customized. A lot of our materials are proprietary. 
what this will do is uh, this will strengthen our competitive advantage, create barriers to entry, protect our brand, generate potential licensing revenue, increase transaction leverage and shareholder value. Uh, we've identified at least 20 plus uh, patent applications uh, that we're going through. I think we've already filed 10. Uh, you'll continue to see some good news flow on uh, filing of more um, IP. And now with our vertical integration uh, kicking in and us actually being able to make these parts in-house, we'll actually be able to uh, file additional IP around that as well. And what we're going to do is pretty much take all the IP we have and transfer it from uh, what we're learning with K-Cups to other um, uh, product initiatives. This is something interesting that's come out for us. Uh, you know, we were approached by a large uh, uh, mask maker. Um, I think it's one of the third largest mask makers to come up with the composable mask. You know, in general, 100 billion plus masks are uh, used and uh, uh, gone to waste every month. So, you know, we were approached by a uh, leading hospital as well as a uh, large uh, mask uh, uh, maker out of uh, out of Asia to come up with a fully composable mask. This is a challenging pro uh, project. This is not taking away from our um, labor resources here as we're working with different institutions to come up with a solution. So in the next while, you should see some uh, news on uh, our steps towards uh, de-risking and making a fully composable mask as well. This is our state-of-the-art commercial facility. We own the facility outright. This is in uh, Vancouver or just outside of Vancouver, right by the U.S. border. It's about 20,000 square feet. We own 10,000. We just leased the 10,000 square feet next door. So 10,000 square feet will be used for um, uh, production and the other uh, 10,000 square feet will be used for our vertical integration, meaning uh, the making of the parts as well as some R&D uh, initiatives uh, for other products. This is uh, our funded annual capacity. This is where we're hoping to get to by the end of 20, or, or early Q1 2022. We want to be able to do 50 million. Uh, we want to have the capacity to do 50 million Nespresso pods and 170 million uh, K-cups. In general, uh, even with those numbers, keep in mind that with that 220 uh, million capacity, it's still a kick in the bucket. Uh, or still, It's very small uh, versus the overall industry, as I mentioned. Uh, 18 billion K-cups produced a year and uh, 23 to 25 billion Nespresso pods. This is something we launched. Uh, we just launched our first product last week, uh, Zoma Superfoods. It's a high quality coffee and superfoods uh, for functional health and a greener planet. Uh, we've launched two SKUs so far. We've launched a, uh, an MCT coffee, which is a higher fat coffee. What, what this product line is about is really uh, using coffee uh, to get your daily nutritional intake. So, you know, we've launched a, an MCT coffee. Uh, we just recently launched a Mindful Mushroom, which just launched on Tuesday. Uh, we've launched a, uh, we're going to be launching a third SKU, which is a, um, an M or a keto coffee, which is a high fat coffee. But you're going to see us come out with uh, potentially some vitamin coffees, collagen uh, coffee with collagen, uh, you know, it's really endless. Turmeric lattes, there's there's a lot of opportunities. I think by the end of uh, June, you should see us have six, uh, six different SKUs. You'll also see us uh, come out with a subscription-based model. Uh, as I mentioned, we launched about a week ago, and we've had some good success without really kicking in the digital, uh, digital spend on marketing. So we expect this to be a very successful product line for us. Uh, just going through this more uh, value creation, uh, talking about uh, the, the single serve coffee model. You know, we are at lab scale. You know, right now we could do about 20 million pods. Uh, we got that capacity in-house right now. Uh, by Q1 or very early Q1, we should have the capacity to do 200 million pods. But I think once we show we could scale the um, technology, we've got a very flexible model. You know, we'll look at licensing. We'll look at partnering. We'll look at a Tetra Pak style model where, you know, maybe we send a dosing ceiling uh, line uh, out to um, uh, out to a customer and we just sell them the product. So it's 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 more of a licensing uh, licensing style, uh, style model. And that's how we're really going to scale this to over a billion plus pods uh, uh, later down the road. But with all other technologies or other product initiatives we look at, we will be looking at licensing the, uh, those other technologies out the gate. We are not the experts in masks or anything else. Uh, the, the one area that we really do understand is coffee, and we see uh, 
we see a, a, a massive opportunity be, become disruptive in the single serve coffee space. This is our leadership team. Darren comes from a, uh, uh, Darren Foots comes from a, um, a coffee background. Uh, myself, I'm uh, the president. I come from an investment banking background. You know, we really do have a best of breed. Uh, we've got Ch uh, Zach Hudson, who's a polymer scientist. He's our chief science officer. Uh, Don Chisholm and Anthony Rosenfeld, uh, which, uh, who both come from a marketing background. Uh, they've had some successes with uh, Mark Anthony Group, uh, Vega in the past, and they've been uh, instrumental in, uh, in launching our Zoma uh, pods uh, uh, right now. Paul Bogle, uh, he's been helping us with our automation. Paul comes from an automation background. Recall all our automation is highly customized. There is not, um, these aren't, uh, you, you can't just buy these machines from, uh, from one of the machine suppliers. Like this is very highly customized, a lot of IP behind it, a lot of trade secrets. And Paul's been uh, really helping us uh, uh, build out that, uh, uh, build out our uh, lines. Uh, our board of directors, um, you've got myself, Darren uh, Futz, who's the CEO, Haytham Hodele, who uh, runs or uh, comes from uh, a royalty background. He, he's part of uh, Wheaton Precious Metals, which is a large silver gold royalty company. Uh, Graham Gilly and Killian Ruby, who, uh, who comes with, uh, with an accounting background. He's a CA by practice and runs his own firm. <clears throat> This is an interesting slide. We've got a lot of good uh, government relationships. Uh, we've got uh, good support at the municipal level, the provincial level, and the federal level. We've received uh, 5 million in government grants and contributions over the years. And as we get into more product initiatives, we'll always have the support to go back to the government and get some grant money, some non-dilutive capital to launch new products, whether it's eyeglasses, yogurt cups, um, coffee creamers, anything like that. So. This is our capital table, uh, about 121 million shares fully diluted. Uh, we have, uh, we just finished a, a very successful capital raise. Uh, you know, we have access to over 50 million uh, in, in the bank. So uh, there is no financing risk here. It's really for us is uh, execution. And uh, as I mentioned, we have, uh, we have plans to, uh, uh, we just launched our Zoma. Uh, you'll see news on uh, a continued development on Nespresso, which we're expecting to launch in uh, early Q3. And you'll continue to see us have IP news and then get into other product initiatives, as well as announce new co uh, commercial partnerships uh, later in the year as all our equipment comes in-house. So very exciting company, uh, catalyst rich, cashed up. Um, it's, it's, it's one, uh, it's, it's, I think it's one to watch, especially with all the uh, catalysts and developments coming down the pipeline. And that is our presentation. Hi, Ash. So let's uh, throw in a couple of questions. So the first one coming from John uh, McClendon. So are there any plans to have next to put on shelves of the grocery stores next to other brands? You know, it's it's there is an opportunity for that. Um, you know, the one thing is coffee is a convenience product. So, you know, it should be something that you could order online. The world is changing to online ordering. Uh, you know, Amazon's really taking over. I don't really think you need to go to the coffee shop to, uh, to, uh, to go buy our pods, but you know, uh, we have been, uh, we have been um, uh, chased to look at uh, some coffee or coffee distribution and grocery as well. So uh, I'd prefer e-commerce, but we will look at, uh, we will look at uh, grocery as well. So one last question here before we go, what's your action plan to increase the distribution capabilities and lower the shipping cost? A lot of it is just going to be um, other facilities outside of Vancouver. Uh, you know, we're going to put something uh, on the East Coast. We will look at eventually put something uh, in Europe. Uh, but the distribution is really going to be, you know, we're getting a lot of calls from a lot of big brands right now uh, to, um, uh, to use our product. We just need to get the platform in-house, which we're expecting to have you know, fully ready through Q1 here, but you will see us uh, announce some uh, key uh, customer contracts later in the year. And as I mentioned, uh, Vancouver will not just be the only um, uh, uh, operating plant for next. We will have uh, plants in, 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 on the East Coast. And that's, you know, uh, with the shipping costs, you know, the vertical integration is a big part of that. Uh, you know, not uh, dealing with uh, uh, suppliers and service pr uh, providers in Asia making this uh, a true made in North America story, that will reduce shipping costs as well as uh, make this uh, a, a lot more 
it'll be a quicker process uh, to control our supply chain. So thank you, Ash, for being here with us, uh, sharing your latest uh, story. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gilbert.